We're going to start in chapter 18. But I want to recap what's been going on. And particularly just last week to bring out a point in the chapter we looked at last week. So remember last week was the one of the most famous stories from the Bible. And that was the story of David versus Goliath. And what did we say? What was... What was so interesting about this? Well, I mean, there was so much that was interesting about this, but one thing in particular. This scene is set in late Bronze Age Israel, early Iron Age. And it's a conflict between probably the relatively backward people of Israel and probably the relatively... Uh, modern or upper end or higher end on the technological scale um, Philistines and remember we talked about <coughs> Goliath having the range of weapons that he had and what was what did we mention that was so big about his equipment that gave him a technological advantage spearhead he had a spearhead of iron so while most of his armor was bronze, which was probably the custom at that point, he had a special iron spearhead. And in the game of rock, paper, scissors, uh, iron beats bronze in weapons very handily. So he had a technological advantage. And, and remember, what did David do? How, how was it that David went about defeating Goliath? What were the weapons? Well, he went to a nearby location and he just picked up a small number of slinging stones. And so I wanted to bring something out. Goliath had the technology. Iron Age Goliath versus Bronze Age David. And what did David bring? Stones. Sticks and stones. <laughs> What's the point I want to make here? They will break your bones. Stone Age technology defeated Iron Age technology. God used weapons of the previous age to defeat the man who had the technological advantage. Wow. Wow. Now let's follow up and see what happens and develops. <clears throat> this is David's entrance onto the political scene in Israel. We already know that David has been anointed to be the next king. And we're about to find out how Saul feels about that. Saul has been rejected. And I just want to point something out. Saul had a response. He had a way that he could have responded, let me put it that way. When God said, I'm done with you on the throne, Saul could have gone to God and said, Lord, here's your crown. How can I help your king? How can I come back into your fold not fit to be the king any longer you've rejected me but I want you to see that Saul has set upon a course of evil so let's take a look 1 Samuel chapter 18 so David and Saul finished talking and soon David and Jonathan became best friends Jonathan thought as much of David as he did of himself. From that time on, Saul kept David in his service and would not let David go back to his own family. Jonathan liked David so much that they promised to always be loyal friends. Jonathan took off the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David. He also gave him his military clothes, his sword, his bow and arrow and his belt. 
Now, do you know what some profane people accuse? I heard a lot of this growing up. Oh, David and Jonathan were gay lovers. Where do you see that in the text? That's just ignorant. You know, it presumes that men can't have a love for each other that isn't erotic. And that's false. We should have a love, one man for another. But not an erotic love. It should be a love that is high and holy and God-honoring. Did you see here that Jonathan recognized what Saul didn't? Jonathan, who was Jonathan? Jonathan was the heir apparent. And even Jonathan saw David and said, This is the Lord's chosen. Not himself. And remember how I said Saul had the option to say, Lord, you have said I'm no longer fit to be king. Let me let me do my everything to prepare and to hand over my crown to the one who is. Well, look at this. This is exactly what Jonathan is doing. Jonathan promised to always be loyal friends. He took off his robe that he was wearing and gave it to David. What does that mean? The status, the clothing that David, that Jonathan had. Jonathan is saying, you're the one who deserves to be in this class, in this status. And I deserve to be under you, under your authority. He also gave him his military clothes, his sword, his bow and arrow, and his belt. So we see that Jonathan is reacting and responding in precisely the way that Saul could have, but didn't. Let's continue and see how this goes. David was a success in everything that Saul sent him to do, and Saul made him a high officer in his army, and that pleased everyone, including Saul's other officers. Now, David had killed Goliath. The battle was over, and the Israelite army set out for home. As the army went along, women came out of each Israelite town to welcome King Saul. They were singing happy songs and dancing to the music of tambourines and harps. And I'm going to stop there before I read the next verse. <clears throat> Look at Saul's pathology. This is the high point. This is a time of victory. This is the time of God's greatest triumph for the nation in Saul's reign to this point. And look and see what is on Saul's mind. Look and see what is on Saul's heart. I'm going to give you a hint. It's madness. He's going to find defeat and despair and enmity, and enmity in the midst of absolute victory. <clears throat> so the women sang, Saul has killed a thousand enemies and David has killed ten thousand enemies. <clears throat> but who ought to be angry here and who ought to be happy? Well, well David ought to be happy. He's got the highest esteem. <coughs> Who else ought to be happy? Saul ought to be happy. He's killed his thousands. This is... Do you see that, that what is the unraveling of Saul is not <coughs> because God came against him and Saul just wanted to serve God but was prevented by it. Rather... God saw that Saul was going down this evil path, this dissolution, this descent into madness. He saw it 
from afar. He knew what was going down long before anybody else knew. And so this song, verse 8, made Saul very angry. Wow. This is my whole point. Everything we see with Saul, <coughs> every response <coughs> is a response of profanity, a response of God-hating, a response mm. to evil, and a response, a direction, turning from wholesomeness and goodness, and turning toward the very worst of evil. <coughs> this made Saul angry, and Saul thought, they're saying that David has killed ten times more enemies than I ever did. Next, they want to make him king. Bing, 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 yeah. bing, bing. Is Saul right? <laughs> yeah, he's right. But here's the thing. <clears throat> so what? That's God's purpose. <clears throat> God has anointed David, David to be king. Saul could have done what Jonathan did. Here's my point. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who want to paint this out as if David was a usurper. Or David <coughs> took what didn't belong to him. And that <coughs> poor Saul, you know, he had this treacherous underling who just came and stole his throne. And that Saul was right to hold on <coughs> to power the way he did. But Jonathan is the example that proves him wrong. Verse 9 says, Saul never again trusted David. Mm -hmm. The next day the Lord let an evil spirit take control of Saul. And he began acting like a crazy man inside his house. David came to play the harp for Saul as usual. But this time Saul had a spear in his hand. Oh, la -dee da I just happened to have a spear in my hand. Imagine, imagine me having a toothache or, or me being down and you come over to play some music for me as a friend. And I just happen to have a gun in my hand. It just happened to be spinning the chambers. It just happens to be loaded. Do you see the setup here? None of this is an accident. Saul didn't just <coughs> happen to have a spear in his hand. He had murder on his mind. Saul thought, I'll pin David to the wall. He threw the spear at David twice. But David dodged and got away both times. Now do you see it? He threw the spear once. And David's playing his heart. Whoa! And he moves. He gets out of the way. And then he continues playing. And then Saul throws the spear at him a second time. Do you get the hint here? Oh, it was just an accident. I just happened to throw it at David. Oh, it slipped out of my hand. Spear's fault. Yeah, exactly. it's the spear's fault. We should, we should outlaw all spears. We should prosecute all spear manufacturers. Come on, evil, wicked people. So Sri comes over and he plays music for me <clears throat> to comfort me because I'm not feeling good. My spirits are down. And he just knows, hey, why's Brock got that gun? Oh, why is he spinning it around like that? It's making that clicking sound. Oh, look, he's pointing it at me, but I'm sure it's an accident. Oh, he shoots me and I do my Keanu Reeves Matrix <laughs> roll away and dodge it. Oh, and then he shoots at me again. I do my other roll away and then Bruce comes to the door what's going on in here oh nothing Bruce it, the gun accidentally went off hello <clears throat> this is what it is when you've got murder on your mind Saul was afraid of David verse 12 because the Lord was helping him and was no longer helping Saul Saul put David in charge of a thousand soldiers and sent him out to fight. The Lord helped David. And he, he and his soldiers always won their battles. This made Saul even more afraid of David. But everyone else in Judah and Israel was loyal to David because he led the army in battle. 
Do you see the do you see what it is here? Saul says, I can't kill him myself. So I'll see to it <clears throat> that our enemies kill him. One day Saul told David, If you'll be brave and fight the Lord's battles for me, I'll let you marry my oldest daughter, Merab. But Saul was really thinking, I don't want to kill David myself, so I'll let the Philistines do it for me. David answered, How could I possibly marry your daughter? I'm not very important, and neither is my family. You see, at that time, the king's daughters were generally diplomats. They were generally um, part of the diplomacy system. <clears throat> and they were typically reserved for marriage to other kings. Or I should say to other princes. <clears throat> so if I'm a king of a Bronze Age kingdom and Sri's a king of his Bronze Age kingdom and we want to be buddies, one of the great ways that we can <coughs> work, work it through is I send over my daughter to marry his son and now our two kingdoms have something in common that, that we can be allied together and my daughter can represent my interests at Sri's court and Sri's son can represent Sri's interests at my court so this is really you know David is responding here and saying something's not adding up I'm a, I'm a common person I'm not I'm not of the stock that marries the king's daughters But when the time came for David to marry Saul's daughter, Merab, what did Saul do? Saul told her to marry Adriel from the town of Meholah. What's going on here? He's faithless. He has no intention of letting David marry into the royal line. It's an excuse to kill him. So Saul had another daughter, Michael. And Saul found out that Michael really was in love with David. This made Saul happy and he thought, I'll tell David he can marry Michael and he can set it up. The Philistines will kill him. He told David, I'm going to give you a second chance to marry one of my daughters. You scum! <laughs> and by the way, what does Saul think of even his own daughters? Not very highly. They're just, they're just pawns in his politics. Saul ordered his officials to speak to David in private. So they went to David and said, Look, the king likes you. And all his officials are loyal to you. Why not ask the king if you can marry his daughter, Michael? I'm not rich or famous enough to marry Princess Michael, David answered. <clears throat> and by the way, he answered well. If you were a common person, and you went to have an audience before the king, and you said, Your Highness, your daughter is hot. I really want to be with her. What were you doing? You were signing your own death warrant. Because... They were the king's prized jewels, and they were reserved for the most special of purposes. Remember we talked about the best of fine china? David is saying, I'm not worth the fine china. And by the way, he was answering rightly. So something's going on here, something fishy. And Saul is saying <coughs> the exact opposite of what he truly means. So he's talking in public, and he's scheming in private. He's showing favor in public, and behind the scenes, he's got murder on his mind. So the officials <coughs> went back to Saul and told him exactly what David had said. Saul was hoping the Philistines would kill David, and he told his officials to tell David, the king doesn't want silver or gold, just wants to get even with his enemies. All you have to do is keep fighting Philistines until they've killed you. I hope that's not what it says. All you have to do 
<coughs> is bring back proof that you've killed a hundred Philistines. Well, I got it right the first time, didn't I? All you have to do is keep fighting Philistines until they kill you. And Saul thought, oh, a hundred. That's got to be enough. By the way, what does this say about who Saul thinks were the, were the biggest and baddest dudes on the block? He didn't think his own army was necessarily going to be up to this task. He didn't think very much of them at all. So the officials told David, and David wanted to marry the princess. So King Saul had set a time limit. And by the way, I mean, you know, is this not passive-aggressive manipulative? He set a time limit. And before it ran out, David and his men left and killed 200 Philistines, twice as many as were asked. He brought back the proof and showed it to Saul so he could marry Michael. Saul agreed to let David marry Michael. And Saul knew that she loved David and also realized that God was helping David. But knowing all these things made Saul even more afraid of David. And he was David's enemy for the rest of his life. The Philistine rulers kept coming to fight Israel, but whenever David fought them, he won. He was famous because he won more battles against the Philistines than any of Saul's other officers. Do you see the picture? There's a verse in the scriptures that says God exalts and God puts down or brings love. And it's true. I have what I have. And I have the status that I have. Not because I'm better than the guy down the street who has a lower status, perhaps, in society than me. I'm not better than him. I received a favor. I received an endowment, a goodness from God that that man down the street did not receive. It may not be that way forever. God may lift up and God may take down. And maybe ten years from now that man, I'm working for him and he has the high status. I saw this uh, skit, sketch, this comedy sketch maybe ten or fifteen years ago maybe even longer than that. Uh, it was on Saturday Night Live. I'm not going to say back when they were good. <laughs> because um, even as far as I can remember, they were always a little off. But it was a very goony sketch. So it was two men, and it was in the corporate office. And one man is the janitor, and the other man is sitting at the CEO desk. And the sketch starts off, and the man at the CEO desk says, you know Frank, isn't life funny? We went to the same high school, took the same classes, dated the same women, went to the same college, and yet here I am now, president and CEO of Acme Company, while you're the janitor cleaning my office. Isn't life funny? And then they both laugh. So then the scene fades to black, it comes up again, and it's the same two men in the same office, except now the guy who was the CEO is mopping the floor, and he's the janitor, and the guy who's the janitor is now the CEO. And so the new guy, who's now the CEO, says, you know, Tom, isn't it funny how you were the CEO over me and I was the janitor, but then I slipped taking the supplies back to the broom closet. I slipped, fell on the floor, hired a really great lawyer, and sued your company for everything. And now I've won, and I'm the CEO, and you're the janitor, and you work for me. And they lift their heads up and laugh. Isn't life funny? So then the scene fades to black, opens up again, 
and the places are switched back again. So the original CEO is in, is in the chair, and the original janitor is back to janitoring. <coughs> and he says, the, the, the CEO, the new CEO, the original CEO, this is going to get confusing, I hope I don't lose you. But he says, <coughs> hey Frank, wasn't that funny how you sued me and got my company and, and you were the CEO, but then later on afterwards that hostile takeover came out and I went to the leverage buyout firm and borrowed money and enough to leverage and buy all the shares of stock and become CEO <laughs> again and now now you work for me, I'm the CEO and you're the janitor. Isn't life funny? And they look at each other and laugh. And then the scene fades to black. And it comes back up again. And the two men are there and again the scenes, the, the roles have reversed, the positions have changed, and the man who was originally the janitor is now for the second time the CEO, and the man who was originally the CEO is now the janitor. And the new CEO, the original janitor, says, you know Tom, it's funny, because after that leverage buyout and you got your job back, you had no idea about the harassment claim I was going to bring against your firm. <laughs> and we would go into court and I would win a big settlement and now you're out of the job and you're working for me. Isn't life funny? And they go to laugh when the door opens and this well-dressed man walks in wearing a suit and having the briefcase. And he says, what are you two doing in my office? And so the two of them take their janitor supplies and they get out of the office and leave the real CEO to do his work. What was the point of that long discussion? Those two folks were just janitors. And they were pretending to alternate between being the CEO. But in fact, they were both just janitors. And when the real CEO came, he recognized that they were just loafing in his office and he kicked them out. What am I trying to say with all this? Don't be too hung up on status. If you have a low status today, my friend, don't think that you're beyond God, that you're beyond His ability to lift you up. And if you're the CEO of a company, or you have a very high status and prestige, don't think that you're not too high, that God can't bring you down low again. And so we see it here happening. Do you see here that Saul and David are like the two janitors? They're about to do the, the swap in status, only this is for real. And God is behind it all. Why? Because God is sovereign in this world. And this should make us fear Him. Lord God, why am I in the place that I'm at right now? One answer is, you're right where God desires you to be. But, what does it say? The scriptures say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're placing God first, if his kingdom is what matters,